Happy Wednesday, everyone. My name is Yi Ling Zhuang. I'm the Water Resources Regional Specialized Agent in University of Florida, IFAS Extension. Welcome to the Water Wednesdays. Water Wednesdays is a Facebook live series about Florida's precious resource, water. Every Wednesday afternoon at 2 o'clock Eastern Time, we'll live stream a 30-minute talk about Florida's water and what we can do to protect it. You do not need to register. Just follow us on Facebook and turn in every Wednesday afternoon at 2 o'clock to watch the live streaming and interact with our guest speakers. This month, we focus on microplastics. In last several Water Wednesdays, we have learned microplastics never biodegrade. They are in the environment and they seem to be increasing in abundance. In addition, they are eaten by marine life. So how are microplastics affecting the marine ecosystems? With that question, let me introduce today's guest speaker, Dr. Abby Turner. She's the water resources agent in Sarasota County. How are microplastics affecting our marine ecosystems? Let's welcome Dr. Turner. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so happy to be here to talk about microplastics. It's something that I've been researching for a while. Um, so should we get into it? Should I just get started? Yeah, go ahead. The floor is yours. All right, awesome. So as Yili mentioned, my name is Abby Turna and I am the Water Resources Extension Agent at University of Florida IFAS Extension in Sarasota County. And um, while I am a freshwater ecologist, um, I have spent a lot of time thinking about microplastics because microplastics are a great um, identifier or indicator of how our waters are connected. So what starts in the freshwater environment is gonna end up in the marine environment and microplastics are a great way to trace that relationship between freshwater and the marine systems. So I am gonna focus on marine systems today because that is what Elin asked me to do. And um, I just wanna preface all of this with saying I'm not an expert in marine systems, but um, I am very passionate about this topic and I look forward to your questions. So first I work with um, Ringling College of Art and Design students um, well, I have in the past um, to teach them about microplastics and then they do artwork to take what I've said about the science of microplastic pollution and turn it into art. And I really love this because art has a way of evoking um, care and evoking emotion in a way that science just cannot. So here's my first piece of art. I'm going to show you art throughout this. I actually have some art behind me. Um, but this is a piece of art that was done by a student who's from Hawaii, where they personify the ocean. Um, the ocean has a name. And here you can see that the ocean's not feeling well. And so what he did is he took what I, he learned about microplastics being in beauty products. Um, they still are in beauty products, so you have to check your labels for those. Um, but things like um, lipstick and blush. And so as the ocean tried to make herself more beautiful, she actually became sicker and sicker. So let's look at that relationship. Um, before we get into it, here's another piece of information. If you've been reading the news, then you might have seen that um, there is widespread evidence that our synthetic clothing is ending up in the oceans. And so here's a piece of art that shows you that not only has the science shown that it's end up in the ocean, but we also are seeing a huge transfer of these synthetic fibers of microplastic being on the land too. So here you can see, you can't even see the synthetic shirt anymore because it's kind of become one with the land, but just trying to remind you that it's still there. And one way that it's transferred there is through our wash. And so here's another piece of art showing you that, um, you know, sea kelp and everything can actually, fish can actually take up these tiny plastics that come from your wash and um, express them in a lot of different ways. So, Beyond that, I'm gonna to talk to you about how much plastic has been created and how much goes into the ocean. Where does all that plastic go? Um, ingestion among marine life. And then finally I'll end on what we can do. Um, I love this picture. It doesn't bode well with everyone, but one of um, the more sassier students in the class 
decided to make this image of Ariel. Um, so the Little Mermaid getting sick on all the plastic pollution from the ocean. And it says each year, 8 million tons of plastic enters the ocean. That's the equivalent to dumping a truckload of plastic into the ocean every minute. And we'll see that in just a minute. So how much plastic is made? Um, 9 billion tons. That was um, a study conducted by a group of scientists that did an inventory of just about every country in the world to see how much plastic was produced. And they came up with this, this number of 9 billion tons. And that has been really hard to try to communicate to people. So I think the USA Today has done a really good job at translating what does 9 billion tons mean. So it's 18.2 trillion pounds, and it means the equivalent of 1 billion elephants, or the equivalent of 80 million blue whales, or 8,200, I'm sorry, 822,000 Eiffel Towers, or 25,000 Empire State Buildings. So that's another way of thinking of how much plastic has been made in the last um, 70 years. And actually at this point, I'm pretty sure it was just 66 years. So that's a lot of plastic in 66 years. That's a lifetime. That is my father's lifetime. Um, that's how much plastic has been made. Um, so where is it all? Um, well, we know that from another study by almost the same group of scientists um, that predates that one is that a lot of it ends up in the ocean, right? And so you remember that aerial Little Mermaid throwing up. Um, so it's about one truckload per minute of um, plastic being put into the ocean. So there's 8 million tons of plastic in the ocean. It's thought to double within the next couple of years, triple um, a couple of years after that. So we have a huge situation on our hands. So then the question is, okay, we know that we've made a lot of plastic. We know that a lot of plastic goes into the ocean, but where does all of that go? So here's another uh, piece of artwork done by a Ringling College student. And like all students, unfortunately, this student did not put their name on it, so I cannot give them credit. But it's a beautiful piece of work. You can see how the turtle is distraught because all, all the bags that look like jellyfish and doesn't know which one it should eat or if it should eat any of them. So there are a lot of citizen science projects. Um, one that Yi Lin and I are, were and are a part of is the Florida Microplastics Awareness Project. So that's one way that we can find out where all that plastic is going. Um, and that was really modeled off of this adventure scientists, citizen science project, where not only citizens, but actual scientists have collected samples, one liter samples, and looked and counted how much plastic was in that one liter sample of water. And what you can see is that the bigger uh, green dots means more plastic per liter, and the smaller green dots means less. I believe that the blue dots mean fresh water and the green dots mean salt water. And so as it started as an ocean project, people started looking all over for these tiny plastics. So we know that they're abundant. We know that they are um, everywhere across the globe. And you probably have heard of the Great Pacific Garbage Patch because that's one of the most widely known places where plastic is. Um, a lot of people think that the Great Pacific Garbage Patch is this huge island of plastic, but really it's not. It's a place where um, currents come together in a gyre or gyre, however you want to pronounce that. And um, when they come together, they trap trash. And so there's five of them throughout the world and each of them has a lot of trash. Um, the Great Pacific one though is the most notable. And so what you can see here is that Captain Moore is there at the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. And it's not like you can see it from a plane or even from a boat. It's really just the soup of plastic debris within this patch. Um, and the patch shrinks and swells as currents and waves um, um, go through the area. But one thing remains true for this area is that you can find tiny plastics and larger pieces of plastic from the top of the ocean all the way down to the bottom. So it's, it exists throughout the entire water column and that's what makes it unique. But let's move to the Arctic. Did you actually know that, and so before I give you the fact, um, if we move to the Arctic, you can see here where the Arctic is. So we're looking at the top of the globe and um, you can see the Arctic circle. So when I'm talking about the Arctic, I'm talking about everything inside of that circle. And mostly a lot of the studies have been done between Greenland and Norway. Um, so that's at the Southern part of this, um, or really it's at the, um, the bottom of the slide is what I should say. And um, 
What they found recently in the Arctic is that the Arctic Ocean surface waters actually has more plastic than the Great Pacific Garbage Patch and actually more plastic than any ocean basin. And recently um, they found that there was 12,000 pieces of plastic per liter of sea ice um, in the Arctic, specifically in that place where I pointed between Greenland and Norway. And then similarly, there was 14,000 pieces of plastic per liter in snow. That is a lot of plastic, just to make sure we understand what that means. So the typical water bottle is a liter, um, I'm sorry, is a half liter. Um, you put two of those together, that equals a liter. So if you try to sh shove 14,000 pieces of plastic um, within those two water bottles, that's what we would be talking about. Um, but, or you can think about it as like 700 in each bottle, if that's easier for you. But that's a lot of plastic. Um, and, and that recently came out, um, and so now we're really learning, we're, we're really thinking about how then plastic is transferred from maybe the tropical region to uh, the poles. So where else is plastic? Well, honestly, and most depressingly, it's wherever scientists have looked. So every place that they've looked, they found it. There has not literally been a place where they have not found plastic. Even in the most remote areas like the Arctic, places where people do not even live, they have found plastic. Even in the deepest part of the ocean, the Mariana Trench, they have found plastic. So it is really depressing. Um, there's greater than 1400 marine species that have some interaction with plastic that has been published um, by scientists. Most of these interactions are entanglements or ingestion. Um, those are the most common and there's everything. So um, it's from algae all the way up to our biggest um, predators such as dolphins and whales and seals. And so it's really, really everywhere. And we, I don't have a lot of time to go into all the places that it is, um, but I will touch on a few of these. So first you can see the picture maybe in the back of the slide of um, some albatross, Lacian albatross, um, a mom is feeding her chick. And if you can see on the map at the lower right of the slide, then you can see where the Pacific Atoll is, where this picture was taken by Lou Newman, who is a local here. Um, but you can see that red balloon, that's where the Pacific Atoll is. On the right is California and on the left is Asia. So it's really out in the middle of nowhere, but there's so much trash. Um, just to show you, uh, Lou Newman also took this picture of just the amount of trash that there is on that Pacific Atoll, very small island, um, population very, very little. So the, the trash isn't coming from land, it's actually coming from the water in this case. And it's wreaking havoc on these birds. So where else is plastic? Let's look at marine sediments. So there's actually um, lots of plastic found in marine sediments because sea floors are proposed to act as a final sink or a final resting place for plastic debris. Um, and, and globally throughout our oceans, that is what's proposed. Um, plastic polymers that are more dense than seawater obviously would sink, but then also ones that are more buoyant can become biofouled or become fouled with organic material um, or be passed through an organism and then sunk in that manner. And so um, <clears throat> the concentrations that have been found in these sediments um, have been up to 4,356 particles per kilogram. And it's also important to remember that living within these sediments are also benthic organisms or organisms that live in sediments um, as pictured here. And so one of the questions that scientists looked to answer was, okay, so if the sediments are a sink, then um, are these organisms that interact with um, these microplastics in the sediment, are they able to change them from like maybe four centimeters below the surface to bringing them up to being close to the surface where they can have more interaction with organisms and be consumed. And what this particular group of researchers found using, um, using little containers was that only 1% of the plastic was moving from the lower depths to the higher depths. So that's encouraging news, but still what's not encouraging is 4,356 particles per kilogram. What is a kilogram? Well, this bag of party size M&Ms is a kilogram. So if you can shove 4,300 plus microplastics into 
that bag of M&Ms and that's how much we find in soil at the bottom of our ocean. And that was um, in Arctic sediments. So um, another, another group of questions is how did it get there? Here's in the Pacific Ocean. So this is in the West Pacific looking at sediments. Um, you can see where that is um, on the lower left picture where this study was conducted. And again, here are some organisms, it, uh, organisms that interact with the sediments. And um, to the right of the organisms, you can see the abundance of microplastics in marine sediments. And basically the warmer colors equals higher numbers of plastics per kilogram and the lower number, or excuse me, the the green um, and then below green, cooler colors means less plastics um, per kilogram. And so what you can see is that there is a great variety of the amount of plastics that are in a kilogram of sediments at the bottom of the ocean in the West Pacific. But what's interesting here is that not only did they find plastics in these sediments, but they also found that there was a high correlation in the poor water, so that's the water in between the soils, um, that water was going to be much higher in PCBs, which is a persistent organic pollutant that's been banned since the 70s, um, that there's more of that that exists in the poor water if there are high numbers of plastics. So um, that means that the plastics are um, shedding their PCBs into the water, making them more um, well, keeping them around and, and moving them, moving the PCBs and the persistent organic pollutants around, just them um, being adsorbed to the plastics makes them also um, bioavailable and could be potentially one of the reasons why they persisted in the environment for so long. So PCBs, just to give you a little background on PCBs, um, they're not very sexy. They were um, used to, um, keep fires from happening in electron, electric transmission. So they were in um, those big um, transmission boxes for um, electricity to be transferred from the, uh, the station that creates it to your home. And um, it's a great, it has a great ability to not conduct electricity, so not start a fire, um, which was awesome, but also found to be highly toxic toward humans and all life. So that's why it was banned. So let's look at the ingestion. Here's another great piece of artwork by Zach Jones. And what he did was show you all of the things that we consume as humans or use as humans and then throw away just after one time can end up in, in the stomach contents of a fish. So what's interesting here is that these um, two animals were really the poster um, animals for the microplastic problem. So these were one of the first two animals to have their pictures put all over the internet to show off how big of a problem plastic pollution really is. So we have an albatross on the left and a mahi-mahi on the right, but since that time, in the last five years, there's been so much published on um, microplastic ingestion among animals. And I just wanna give you a sense of the animals that have been shown to ingest plastic, include everything from algae to zooplankton, obviously algae is not an animal, but um, zooplankton to fish and also um, ducks, mallards, dolphins, um, oysters, shrimp, marine worms, seals, whales, some of those things that were already on my list, um, lobster, and, and many, many more. Um, and one of the animals that has been used as an indicator species for um, the Arctic and for microplastic pollution more broadly has been um, this fulmar, um, this northern fulmar has had data collected on plastic ingestion since the 1980s. And so it's one of the first um, animals that was ever used to look at the problem of, of plastic pollution. And that's because this bird um, is really found 
mostly within the northern regions, but you can see thanks to the Audubon exactly where it is, uh, where it winters, where it's all season, where its breeding grounds are. But the thing that's really unique about this bird is that it entirely feeds off of the ocean. So um, it's an ocean feeder. And, and so if you want to look at then how the oceans are um, being a sink of plastic, then looking at this bird is a great way of doing that. And since it's been um, looked at since the 80s, what they scientists have found is that there's been a really an exponential increase in the amount of these birds that have plastic contained within their gut contents. Um, the last study, which was done in 2015 that I could find, um, shows that 35 out of the 40 birds did have plastic within, the, within their gut contents. And um, it was about 15 pieces per bird. And that's what that looks like. So those are some of the pieces of plastic that were taken from the bird's digestive tract. But um, this is a very complicated diagram just to show you that microplastics have been found everywhere. So it's not just the birds that are indicators. Um, humans are an indicator, which I'll get to last, but I'm running out of time. But it's been everywhere, phytoplankton, algae, um, annelids, which are worms in the, in the benthic sediments. So just looking at algae, uh, microplastics have been found to be absorbed um, into algae, making a um, <clears throat> making an aggregate, and they can also interfere. Microplastics have been found to interfere with photosynthesis, which that is ha that's the primary production. That's the way um, algae can reproduce, grow, and um, thrive. So that can be a huge problem. Uh, microplastics have been found in invertebrates. So here's a study um, conducted in some deep, deep water. So you can see how deep the water is on the left. That is the um, <clears throat> showing you that the deepest is 2,200 meters below the surface. And the water had 70.8 microplastics per um, cubic meter. And then in these different invertebrates, there's different number of plastics found um, per actual um, gram of tissue of the animal. So it was around one piece um, to a little more than one piece found in these deep ocean invertebrates. And then we can look at small fish that are found. Um, these are called lantern fish. They're found throughout all of the oceans. And so that's why these fish were used to look at whether or not microplastics were found in their guts and also looking at whether or not plasticizers, which are the things that make um, plastic malleable were found um, in their tissues. And they were found to be, yes, that there were plasticizers in their tissue. And this was the first time that it was realized that there was a correlation between plasticizers and also these persistent organic pollutants. So that study really cracked open the door on looking at how microplastics absorb these organic pollutants and how that could then further affect the animals that consume these tiny plastics. And so now we know that there are persistent organic pollutants, that animals are consuming these microplastics. So then the question that has been um, trying to be answered right now, and I think there's some preliminary results that show that plastic is actually accumulated as it moves up the food chain. So you can see that microplastic and plankton would be small compared to microplastic once it gets to the top predator which leaves us, um, so, sorry. Um, so the, here's just another way of showing it that the top predator such as a seal is gonna have way more plastic and pollution that's absorbed to that plastic than the smallest animal that first came in contact with that plastic. And so that leaves us to us, right? We're humans. This is another beautiful piece of artwork um, that shows, you know, as you're drinking water, you're especially from, a bottle, you're going to actually ingest a lot of tiny plastics. Um, another research shows that um, how much humans actually consume plastic. Um, and so what you can see here is just annually consumed by children and adults um, separated by gender. And that's on the left. And so you can see that the scale is up to 60,000 pieces of plastic annually. But then you look at inhaled plastic and look at the scale, it's different here. It starts at 50,000 and it goes up to 150,000. So the scale is much different, but it's just important for you to realize that 
I, I know a lot of people are like, oh, I'm never going to eat seafood again. But there is a study showing that, you know, in the 30 minutes that it takes you to consume seafood, you're inhaling way more plastic than you are um, eating it from that animal, which might be one piece uh, to five pieces versus inhaling. Look at all of that. It's greater than 50,000. So what can you do? Um, I'm running out of time, but you can reduce, reuse, recycle, refuse. You can check your labels on your personal care products. So your makeup, remember the ocean being sick, but also your clothing. Remember that your clothing can leak into the oceans. You can participate in beach cleanups and pick up the, even the smallest things. And I'm leaving you with a message of hope. There's so much going on right now for policy. I just read recently, New Jersey and New York are taking steps. Um, 23 Florida school districts have switched to Switch from plastic and start from lunch trays to cardboard. That's thanks to Maya McGuire and others from the Florida Microplastics Awareness Project. India um, is set to ban single use plastics in the next couple of years. Um, there's been more than 60 countries that have banned single use plastic and that number is growing. Um, IKEA should have phased out all single use plastics by this year. And there's so much more to be hopeful. There's you who watch this so now you can help spread the word and then I like to um, leave you with this. So I'm just going to leave that there so you can um, read it. And if there's any questions, I'd be happy to take them. Thank you. Thank you so much, Abby. So that's very informative. To me, it's not that surprising to know how much microplastics are in the ocean. But when you show me those pictures, I feel like I was still shocked to see like that much plastic in fish or in it just in the soil, in the sediment. Still, it's a very like to me, it's still very shocking. Yeah, but I like how you end the presentation. I always say it's every single step counts. So there is hope. So if you have any questions for Abby, it's your time to put in the comment session. She will take your questions. So I'm checking my Facebook. Um, I haven't seen any questions yet because I know they are about 10 seconds delay. So okay. with that 10 seconds delay, Abby, do you have anything else you want to say? What, um, you know, I didn't talk about local stuff, but um, locally we've, and I live in Sarasota, so we've went around the county looking for microplastics. Um, so we've looked um, at how much we can find per liter um, in the waters. And we found, you know, around two pieces per liter, which is about the average. Um, but Moat Marine is also here and they've uh, looked at um, sea turtles, baby sea turtles that were, um, I don't know, I'm sorry, I forgot the technical term, but it's when they're washed up on the beach, um, when they're babies. And so I guess they're called stranded. And then they take them back to moat to, because you, you can't just leave them there because they could become um, prey, very easy prey. So they took them back and, and a lot of them actually ended up dying. So they did necropsies on them and found lots of plastic in these baby sea turtles that were like, hours old. Um, so that's, that's also a huge problem. But then they also started looking at plastics and sand where sea turtles um, make their um, burrows to bury their eggs and found that the plastic can actually heat up the sand and then change the gender of the sea turtles, which is also really shocking. So it doesn't just affect the oceans um, or creatures within the ocean themselves, even creatures that haven't even made it to the ocean yet, can be affected by um, these plastics. Wow. <laughs> I don't know what else to say. It's, uh, uh, I have a question here for you. Uh, is bioplastic a solution to the plastic pollution crisis? So I'm so glad actually before Abby answered that, I want to just jump into this question. Yeah, I'm so did. glad you asked that question because last Water Wednesdays so we did a talk. It's about bioplastics. Uh, Dr. Maya, the founder of the Florida Microplastic Awareness Project, uh, she gave a very informative talk about bioplastics, uh, like what, like, uh, what bioplastics are and are they environmentally friendly than petroleum-based uh, 
plastics. So if you miss this talk, you can I will post a link in the chat box, and you can uh, watch the recording. And the meanwhile, probably I will give Abby thirty seconds to answer the question. <laughs> well, um, you know. Not all bioplastics are um, equal. So, as if you, I really suggest you watch that uh, Facebook Live that Yilin did with Dr. Maya McGuire, because that really helps break down the different types of plastic, bioplastics, and how they break down then differently in the environment. And so, some of them um, really are just in the environment, they do the same harm as. Um, fossil fuel based plastic. The only difference environmentally then would be that they weren't, they didn't come from fossil fuels, right? So that itself is an environmental harm. So then being from a plant-based product that's renewable makes it a less environmental harm. But once it, once it breaks up into smaller, smaller pieces and makes its way out into the environment, um, it can still absorb those persistent organic pollutants. And there's really not much of a difference. They can still last in the environment for a long time. But then there are better plastics that I don't know if made it to market yet, which Maya, Dr. Maya also talks about, um, which can break down much, much quicker. And so when those come online, I think that will be a, a lot better of a product, but I, I don't think that's available yet. Great, thank you, Abby. Um, I have another question for you here. A microplastics used in pharmaceuticals. Are, is the question, are they, or is there just a comment that they are? Oh, uh, it's a question. Oh, excuse me. Uh, the question is, uh, how are microplastics used in pharmaceuticals? That's a good question that um, I don't know the answer to. Um, there, are, there are different types of long chain polymers, which are, which are plastics that have different um, chemistry so when, and different um, relationships with water. And I, I don't, I can't tell you all that because I'm not a chemist. And, and so I don't know that specifically, but I do know a study in which that looked at how microplastics and actual pharmaceutical pollution, specifically looking at um, a common antibiotic tetracycline and how um, those two things combined can actually cause greater harm to animals than either one alone marine animals specifically. Could you share that link with me so I can post it on Facebook? For that it's study? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. That's awesome, thank you. Um, if you have more questions, so you can still post on the comment section. We'll still have time to answer your questions. Uh, let me just double check if I miss any questions. I think um, we answered all the questions uh, so far. Great. So before we let Abby go, I do want to say it's uh, um, thank you, Abby. Thank you so much for the informative talk. And if you like our Water Wednesday series, uh, please give us a thumb up and share this video with your friends and families. I also post a link in the um, comment section, it's our evaluation. We will really appreciate uh, if you can take a few minutes uh, to complete the survey and uh, tell us uh, how we can improve the Water Wednesday series. Uh, and uh, a little bit get into next month, because September we focus on microplastics uh, um, because uh, September is a microplastic awareness month. And for next month, we'll change topic a little bit. Uh, we'll move from microplastics to agriculture. So I think I haven't done anything uh, related to agriculture yet. Uh, and I think uh, we usually have misconsumption of uh, agriculture. So next month, we'll talk about uh, the best magic uh, practices uh, used in agriculture in our food system. So please stay tuned and follow us, like us on Facebook, and see you all next Wednesday. Bye. Bye. Thank you.